Well, my daddy left home when I was three and didn't leave much to ma and me but this old guitar and an empty bottle of booze. Well, I don't blame him because he run and hid, but the meanest thing that he ever did is before he left, he would name me Sue. Oh, now that's a song by Johnny Cash, actually written by Shel Silverstein. Go look that one up. But I heard it by Johnny Cash years ago when I was about 10 or so. And folklore in my family was that on a trip from Corpus Christi all the way to Haskell, Texas, which is about an hour north of Abilene, for eight or more hours as a 10-year-old boy, I sang that song. And I love the song, and I remember singing it on the way up. And But I was told that I sang it rather constantly, and that it became an irritant for the whole family. And I sang it again and again and again, and I, I, I love the song. And I love the struggle in the song that there's this guy who grew up with this incredible angst and pain, and it was a burden for him, and his response was vengeance. And then finally, when he gets a chance for vengeance, it gets transformed into blessing. It took me a while to, to realize that. But one of the things that I'm reminded of is that early on in my life, I could be an irritation to people. That was news to me. And ever since that learning as a child of 10, I have turned the other leaf over and I'm no longer an irritant for people in <laughs> any sort of way. <laughs> Honey, I'm trying to do a little video here. So I'm no longer well, an irritant. I thought that you might want to be telling people the truth since you were broadcasting. Honey, I am telling people the truth. I had this learning. I could be an irritant. No longer am I an irritant. Yes. You are. No, I'm not. Honey, you are, really. I am not. R2. Am not. R2. Am not. R2. Am not. R2. Am not. Okay, okay, so it could be that that in your house there's frustration. Now, now you, you know, that was just a little fun thing Margo and I did. That, that doesn't reflect reality at all, right? Huh. But it could be that People in your house have been an irritant to you. It could just be the whole isolation thing is an irritant to you. But in the middle of all of that irritation and all of that difficulty is this incredible opportunity for learning. What might God be hoping to use all of the irritation of people, of just the situation, to bring to you. So I'm back here in the back of the church parking area by the dumpster where there's a bunch of pods. There's a couple of scout pods, a youth pod, a children's ministry pod, a couple of Sea City work camp pods, and I'm in the home in a week pod. And, and it reminds me, like I know it reminds you on this Wednesday, it reminds you of Numbers 13 and 14, right? Am I right? <laughs> Go ahead and say it. I was just thinking of Numbers 13 and 14. So Numbers 13 and 14. It's uh, a year and a half, give or take, into the Exodus experience. The Hebrew people have crossed the Red Sea. They've made it all the way to Mount Sinai, received the Ten Commandments, had the whole golden calf thing, that takes about a year's time that they're around Mount Sinai. And then, a year and a half into this experience comes Numbers 13 and 14. And Moses sends 12 spies, they call them sometimes in Scripture, into the Promised Land to scout it out and to see what's available, what they're walking into. The 12 come back with a report, and 10 of those 12 come back with a fearful report. And they say, beautiful land, flowing with milk and honey, but it's too scary for us to go in there. And only two people, Joshua and Caleb, have a different point of view. 
it is a beautiful land. It is filled with giants and other scary things, but with God's help, we can and we should step into the promised land. But as you well know, those 10 with their fearful, oh no, oh no, we can't do it. It infects the people. And there's this rebellion that starts up. And the people are saying, no, let's go back to Egypt. Let's stop this. Let's, oh, this is terrible. We can't make it to the promised land. And it's one of those turning points. God's response, in essence, is to say, these people and the difficulty that is before them, they're not ready for that to become a blessing. They haven't learned yet how not to push that back or, or deflect it. So you're going to spend, God says, another 38 years. 38 years in the wilderness until you're ready to respond more faithfully. One of my suspicions is, is that the Hebrew people, even though they'd been through this miraculous time, the frustrations of what was around them and the fears that were, were deeper than a year and a half could, could pull out of them. It was that difficult time for them. What God knew was that they had some learning to do. They hadn't learned to walk in faith, even though they'd probably had some experiences of that. But in a difficult time, it wasn't there. So it took 38 years for them to learn something. The frustrations and the angst did not, did not develop for them into a learning, except in that next 38 years. I'm hopeful that it will take 38 years for us to learn what God uh, desires for us to learn in the present difficult times. So at home in a week, like Sea City Work Camp and thousands of other expressions of church faithfulness, of people's faithfulness, comes in mission trips. Mission trips where a group of people go away and offer uh, to work very often on people's homes fixing roofs and repairing things. It's been my experience for the last 40, 45 years that um, groups of 10 or more go away for maybe five days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And by Wednesday, the frustrations have built up. On Wednesday, people have exhausted all of their defense mechanisms and all of their abilities to deal with an uncomfortable situation, physically uncomfortable, maybe as hot as it could be. They're doing work that's not normal for them. And it just kind of builds up. And on Wednesday, it's not uncommon that people, people have to make a decision. Are they gonna stand back and wait it out and remove themselves as much as possible from the things that bother them? Or are they gonna take ownership of that project, whatever it is, and are they going to show their vulnerability to their brothers and sisters in Christ that they're with, all ten of them? It's in those moments of difficulty that I've seen incredible learning and incredible life-changing experiences. Very often people come back from a mission time and reflect about how wonderful it was to serve others. Absolutely. Another common reflection is to take back a sense of awe that people in such incredible poverty can have such joy. Very common thing, always true. But there are some who in the midst of that angst and, and difficulty and adversity, they don't step back and step away hunker down until the end they can go back and actually use that Jesus posture and embrace the uncomfortableness and the difficulty the out of my element uncomfortableness and they learn something and their faithful foundation grows they 
they realize that they can be vulnerable beyond what they present on the surface, and they can learn something about themselves, about God's graciousness, and how God desires to move in them and through us. So what is it that God is hoping that we, that me, that you, will learn in this present time? What if the frustrations of staying at home, not being able to interact, what if God is is trying to mold and shape those into something? What are you learning? What are you learning in the midst of this present difficulty? I pray God's blessings upon that process for you and for us as a church and for us as a world. Let all God's people say, Amen.